Good evening and thank you for coming. Before we begin with the panel presentation, every spring we begin this evening with honoring the recipient of the Edith Mueller Scholarship. Edith Mueller was a recreation, park, and leisure studies major at the University of Minnesota during the 1980s and to her untimely death in May of 1982. Her parents, Mike and Van Mueller, who are with us here this evening, have established a fitting tribute to the vitality and purposefulness of their daughter's life. The Edith Mueller Scholarship encourages undergraduate pursuing a degree in recreation, park, and leisure to deepen their commitment to academic study and professional practice. We would like to thank the Mueller family for providing the scholarship and the opportunity for one of our students. Thank you. Steve Hurd is not a traditional student. After earning an associate degrees some years ago and working in communication and broadcasting for several years, Steve decided to return back to school to complete his bachelor's degree in recreation, park, and leisure studies. Steve began taking classes, doing group projects with fellow students that were roughly the same ages as his daughters. Steve really embraced this experience and became a friend and mentor to his classmates. I have not known a time when Steve has not given 110% to whatever the task at hand. Everything is done with enthusiasm and gusto. Work and life experiences have been shared, words of wisdom imparted on his classmates. Whether or not they're followed seems to, uh, remains to be seen. This semester, Steve has been interning with the Minnesota State High School League, working with various sports, uh, winter sports tournaments, and he's looking forward to working with the upcoming adaptive sports tournaments at, as this population has become of particular interest to Steve. Steve will be graduating in May, and I will be sad to see him go. I am confident, however, that he will do well. He will be a proud alum, and as he embarks on a new career and in this um, field of recreation, park, and leisure. The 19, uh, excuse me, the 2011 Edie Mueller Scholarship recipient is Stephen Hurt. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Mary Jo Kane, and I am the director of the Tucker Center. Before I begin my remarks, I want to thank you all for coming to tonight's event and to let you know that there, there will be a reception in the lobby right after our distinguished speakers uh, and their presentations and what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking question and answer session. Before I begin, though, the introductions and more general remarks, I want to acknowledge a number of individuals in the audience who have been key supporters of the Tucker Center for many years. And I'm going to ask that they stand and be acknowledged, but please hold your applause until the end. And uh, being Minnesotans, I know that they won't be terribly comfortable like standing up for a long time. So I'll try to get through this for them as painlessly as I can. This is what Minnesota Nice is all about, Dr. Brooks. She's from New Jersey, so I'm trying to help her understand our people. <laughs> First is the Dean of the College of Education and Human Development, Jean Quam, who's in the back row. Also towards the back is Professor Maureen Weiss, co-director of the Tucker Center, uh, an internationally renowned scholar who's also done work in this area. Um, Dr. Tony Brown, who is the Associate Director of the Department of Recreational Sports, and he has his degree from our academic department. Regina Sullivan, who is a Senior Associate AD, and Dr. Leo Lewis, uh, who's the Associate AD uh, in the Department of Intercollegiate Athletics, and Leo also is, uh, some of you think that he's kind of a famous guy, but he's actually totally famous for getting his PhD as one of my students. That's. Uh, <laughs> That's kind of the key for you, right? Uh, Laura Johnson, who is the Associate Director of University of Minnesota Relations. And we have two honored guests in the audience tonight that I will tell you a little bit about. One uh, is uh, Sherry Lamke. Sherry, I don't know where you are. There you are. 
and Tom Tro, Tom in the back, they are both with uh, TPT, Channel 2 Public Television. And the reason that they are here tonight is because the Tucker Center and the University of Minnesota has entered into a partnership with them to do a, an educational 30-minute video on this whole topic, which will be shown in the fall, and then I'm hopeful eventually on the Big Ten channel. But I'm going to turn it over to Laura to just say a few words about what the partnership will be all about. Thank you, Dr. King. We are very excited to be working with uh, Twin Cities Public Television to, as Dr. King said, to develop a documentary on the issue of concussions in female sports. Um, the program uh, will include our esteemed um, experts on the panel this evening, as well as draw attention to the significant health and wellness issue of concussions uh, in female athletes um, as it relates to all of those who work with them and care about them, their parents, coaches, educators, as well as policymakers. Um, the program is a wonderful partnership with uh, Twin Cities Public Television. It will air um, in the fall, but it will also be available uh, live streamed on their website at tpt.org. And we will also be featuring it on the university's homepage as well in the fall. Um, we are very, very excited to draw attention to this important issue and um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I also want to give a very special thanks to the Mueller family. Um, not only have they set up a scholarship in their daughter's name, but they've set up an endowment in the Tucker Center that allows us to put on the spring lecture series every year. So I want to thank them for their loyalty and commitment to the Tucker Center and all the work that they've done with us and for us over the last 15 years. So Van and Mike, I don't know where are you, but if you would stand and please stand and be acknowledged for everything you've done. And finally, I want to acknowledge members of the Tucker team for all of the hard work that they do behind the scenes to make this event go so smoothly every year. Alyssa Norris, Julia Dutov, and Jonathan Sweet. And a special thanks, as always, goes out to Associate Director Dr. Nicole Lavoy, who has overseen this entire event, soups to nuts, and it is no small task. The Tucker Center has a threefold mission to conduct research on the impact of sport and physical activity in the lives of girls and women, to provide first-rate educational opportunities for students, and to engage in community outreach and public service. Our distinguished lecture allows us to bring all parts of that mission together by inviting nationally known scholars who can share the latest information and highlight the most compelling issues on how sport and physical activity make a difference for girls and women, their families, and their communities. I can think of few areas more important for us to examine, particularly given how much this issue has been in the news of late, than that of one of the most serious sports injuries that we deal with, concussions. Previous research findings in multiple academic disciplines have sparked a much needed national conversation about the rising incidence, severity, and consequences of sport-related concussion. This conversation has raised our awareness, increased our educational efforts, and spurred policy changes. But unfortunately, the vast majority of concussion-related research and public dialogue has centered on male athletes, especially at the professional level. Yet concussions and their devastating consequences affect athletes in all sports and at all levels, regardless of gender. Previous investigations often failed to examine how one's gender might influence sports participation or was deemed not that relevant. And in far too many cases, as we know, it was assumed that data collected on male subjects could be automatically and directly applied to females. These shortcomings have prompted scholars to ask, do gender differences exist in sport-related concussion risk, symptoms, outcomes, and recovery? To address this critical question, we have invited nationally recognized experts who will discuss the latest research about what is known, and just as importantly, what is not known, regarding the impact of concussions on female athletes. 
Our distinguished panelists will also highlight strategies for future research, as well as educational, public policy, and prevention efforts. So I'd like to invite them up to the stage right now, and uh, I will then introduce each one of them. Our first panelist is Diane Wies Bjornstahl, Associate Professor of Sport and Exercise Psychology in the School of Kinesiology at the University of Minnesota. Professor Wies Bjornstahl is a Fellow of the Association for Applied Sports Psychology and a member of the Research Consortium of the American Alliance of Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. She is currently serving a three-year term for the Sports Science Advisory Board of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Her scholarship focuses on two areas of research, the health and development of competitive youth sports participants, and the psychological response of athletes to sport injury. Professor Wies Bjornstahl is co-editor of the journal Counseling in Sports Medicine and has authored numerous articles in top-tier academic journals. Our second panelist is Dr. Jill Brooks, a clinical neuropsychologist who, in addition to her private practice, serves on the medical advisory board for the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association. Dr. Brooks has published numerous articles in the areas of neurogenic speech and language disorders, executive dysfunction, and concussion in sports. She was instrumental in the creation of the New Jersey State Law for Management of Concussion in Sports, considered the most comprehensive concussion law in the United States. Her research on concussions in female student athletes has been featured in USA Today and ESPN's Outside the Lines. She is a consultant at the high school, college, and professional levels, and in this capacity, she educates coaches and uh, athletic administrators about the dangers of sport-related concussion. Our third and final panelist is Dr. Ainsley Smith, Associate Professor in Orthopedic Surgery and, and Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. Dr. Smith also serves as the Research Director at the Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine Center. She co-directed the first ever Hockey Summit, Action on Concussions, and helped write the seminal document, Zero Tolerance of Concussions and Other Neurotrauma in Ice Hockey. In 2003, Dr. Smith received the Houston Award from the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine for the work that she has done over her career. Dr. Smith co-chairs the Minnesota Hockey Education Program and has been instrumental in implementing the Fair Play Program, which has resulted in reduced violence and injuries in youth hockey. So please join me now in giving all of them a very warm Minnesota welcome. Take it away, Dr. Wies Bjornstahl. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kane, and thanks to the Tucker Center for inviting me to be a part of the panel. Also, I'd really like to thank all of you for turning out this evening. Uh, I really appreciate your attendance, and for those of you listening online as well, we're really grateful because it's such an important topic that any help we can get in spreading the word of how to make things safer for our participants is really appreciated. I've really enjoyed talking with our, my fellow panelists today as well, so it's really been a good day for me. Uh, my job really is to set the scene for the two speakers to come, Dr. Brooks and Dr. Smith. And so I'm going to present you with what I would consider to be sort of the layperson's view, meaning a non-medical view, but a view that all of us as coaches, athletes, and parents in particular, and teammates, should have and an understanding and a foundational knowledge that we should have about concussion as we work with uh, both young athletes, young and old, of all ages, really. And just to give you a little bit of feel for where I'm coming from, I really look at this topic from four frames of reference that'll, that have influenced the kinds of things that I'll be talking with you about tonight. First of all, I'm standing here, as Dr. Kane said, because I'm a sports scientist, if you will, a faculty member at 
the University of Minnesota in kinesiology. However, I'm also a coach. I have been in the past, and I'm currently a youth volleyball coach also. I'm also a parent. I have two teenage athletes, and so have watched them and continue to watch them through th several sports. And unfortunately, have had a son fairly recently with con concussions. So I've seen and understand concussions from a parent's point of view, as well as a coach and sports scientist point of, point of view. And then fourth, as an athlete, unfortunately, I sustained many, many concussions, far too many, uh, over many years of participation and even up into adulthood. And so these, I do understand really from the inside out the devastating consequences of concussions and the importance of treating them properly and getting proper advice and care. And so really all of those frames of reference inform the brief comments that I'll make for you tonight. With that brief preface in mind and background information, there are really three tasks or three goals or objectives that I have to get through in, the, in a little bit of time that I have with you. First of all, a very basic description of what a concussion is and so forth. Uh, secondly, a, a discussion of the basic information about injury surveillance and concussion injury surveillance. What does the literature tell us about the rates of injury and the risk of injury for males and females? And finally, what are some of the specific kinds of risk factors that are starting to emerge from the literature in terms of factors that affect an athlete's risk of concussion? And again, setting the scene for my colleagues to follow. So from a very basic perspective, what is a concussion? Concussion is a traumatic brain injury. It's caused by the brain moving rapidly inside the skull. It's caused in one of two ways, basically, either a direct hit to the head or can be caused by getting a, sustaining a hit or a jolt to the body that makes the head snap. And so that can also be a mechanism by which concussion injury happens. And it leads to physiologic changes in how the brain functions, which Dr. Brooks will be speaking about. But again, every coach, athlete, and parent should really know what a concussion is in a basic sense. According to the so sources that I'm going to rely a lot on tonight in terms of giving you some basic information and sources that I'd encourage you to look up for yourself and, and educate yourself about are from the CDC, very good information uh, that's provided by them both online and available through the mail, and also the National Federation of High School Information. So in particular, these are some facts about concussion that these sources tell us. First of all, all concussions are serious and need to be treated seriously and taken seriously when athletes complain or uh, report symptoms to coaches and others. Secondly, they can occur at any sport and any age. They can occur without loss of consciousness, which has been a, a, a paradigm shift, I guess, in terms of people understanding that you don't have to get knocked out to have sustained a concussion. In fact, most aren't. Repeat concussions are, seem to be particularly hazardous or dangerous, and again, Dr. Brooks will be talking more about this, but it really seems to be the brain is vulnerable, again, to that repeat injury if the first injury has not healed sufficiently. And finally, uh, certainly the evidence tells us that there are some long-term or chronic kinds of symptoms that are possible and certain subset of athletes sustain or continue to experience, I guess, um, well beyond the time at which most, most athletes would be recovered. Again, from a very practical standpoint, how do you tell if an athlete has a concussion? And I think about, um, these are my words, but I've taken, again, the CDC materials and the National Federation of High School materials and really come upon these three words that I keep in mind myself when I'm working with athletes as a coach, for example. I watch for risk events. I've learned and educated myself about the warning signs that I might observe that might clue me in to the athlete having sustained a concussion that they might not even be aware of. And I listen to the symptoms that the athletes describe. But again, I'm speaking from the standpoint of a non-medical professional. What are the kinds of things that a coach or a parent should be in tune with? And these apply to all of us in this room. So for, in terms of watching, we watch for risk events. Again, according to the CDC, a high-risk event is an event in which we observe an athlete sustain a forceful blow to the head or body that results in this rapid movement of the head that we've spoken about, and we see changes in the athlete's behavior or functioning. I also, though, from a standpoint of a coach in particular, have noticed that concussions can happen with what appear to be, to an outside observer, relatively minor sort of event. And again, so it's not always the big obvious event. Certainly those are dangerous and high risk events, but be alert to those more subtle kinds of jolts that an athlete might experience that might also result in concussion symptoms that, that need to be, uh, be seen by a medical professional. So you're watching, you're knowing your sport, you're watching. Secondly, really this comes before all of this, you should learn about what the concussion signs are. So what are things that a coach might observe, a parent might observe, a teammate might observe? Some 
someone other than the injured athlete, what might they notice? And again, according to the CDC, which has really nice materials on this, an athlete might forget sports plays, they answer questions slowly, their movements are jerky or clumsy, and there's something wrong, obviously, in terms of how they act, how they function, how they move. And so those are the kinds of signs that other people might observe in a concussed athlete that should tell you something's wrong and we need to, to take care of this and manage this. Finally, listening to athlete symptoms. So we watch, we learn what things we might see, and we listen to what athletes tell us. Take them seriously. So if an athlete tells you they're having difficulties with some of these cognitive tasks of thinking and remembering, if they tell you about some of these physical symptoms, if they tell you about some of these emotional symptoms, again, you can see the list there, and sleep disturbances. And again, my layperson's understanding of concussion is that these happen in different times and sequences, perhaps, for different athletes. That, in other words, it's individualized to a certain extent, the type of response that an athlete might uh, feel. So again, they're not necessarily going to experience all of these, but these are, again, warning signs. And they also don't necessarily experience all of them right away. They can come, again, uh, some time distant from the actual event. So being attentive and listening to athletes is a very important part. So watching, learning, and listening. Well, if you suspect that an athlete that you're working with has a concussion, what should you do about it? First of all, uh, Dr. Brooks was kind enough and suggested a wonderful idea, which was to contact the CDC and have them send free materials that are available in the lobby after the uh, discussion today. And she's got a wonderful selection of materials out there. And I had never uh, gotten these packets myself. I've looked at the materials very carefully online. All of these materials are also freely available online for download, and they're meant for us to use, so make use of them. Uh, Dr. Smith and I were talking about actually carrying copies of these. They have little wallet cards and things in her purse, or I, I, I keep a stack with my coaching materials when I'm coaching volleyball so that I have some of these materials ready to give to parents so that they can see what I'm doing if I suspect their young person has a concussion. And so again, these are great materials for you to have and do pick some up after the talk today because uh, it's really nice for you to have. The other thing that's on the CDC website, the Heads Up for Concussion uh, materials and, and resources that they have is a online and an online training module, which I did myself. I had my class do in the fall, and it takes less than an hour. It's really important information and something that all of us can do from athletes up through adults, parents, coaches, and so forth. So first of all, go to the CDC, and you can find these materials for yourself. Uh, secondly, I also just found this last week when I was looking around, and the National Federation of State High School Associations has an online training module called Concussion in Sports, What You Need to Know. And I completed that module myself just last week. And again, it took me less than an hour, very helpful information. They had a little bit more information about sort of helping me as a coach understand that return to play protocol. So I found it particularly helpful from that standpoint. So again, I'd strongly encourage all of you in the room, if you haven't done so, to look, take a look at those materials. Well, here's my sort of consolidated action plan. But remember, the action plan is going to be different depending on what role we're playing with the athletes. So if I'm a coach, I have a different role in the action plan than a medical provider or than a parent and so forth. But basically, again, these are my words, a way of, way of remembering, I guess, what it is that the action plan is. But mostly as a coach, the CDC's recommendations to me I think of as remove and refer that I remove the athlete from play if I suspect a concussion based on those signs and symptoms that we've talked about and watching the, the critical events, and that then I need to refer the athlete to a qualified health provider to make an assessment, because I'm certainly not qualified to make any sort of diagnosis or assessment of that as a coach. What I'm watching for is, hmm, there's enough happening that I'm a little worried. I need to get a professional medical health provider's opinion about this. But Again, depending on what you're doing, you might be alone. Many youth sport coaches are alone on the field, and so you might have to be the one. Sometimes a concussion incident is a medical emergency, and you need to know enough about how to get to the medical resources and emergency resources that you can do that, even if you're the only coach on the field sometimes, or you're far removed from um, where uh, there's certainly no athletic trainers or other qualified personnel around. So knowing enough about evaluating the seriousness of a situation and how quickly help is needed, I think is really an important skill for coaches. Uh, informing, I, I think mostly, I work mostly and think mostly about young athletes. And so there's that whole process of alerting to the, the parents who might be attending the game, but they might not be at the game or practice. 
and informing them of what's going on. They might be the ones to take their young athlete, which is what I've seen most often in the youth sports that I work in. The parent is often the one that takes the athlete to the medical provider. So again, there are things that you need to think about within the boundaries of confidentiality and so forth about informing the relevant people, supervisors, administrators, and so on. But generally, the action plan involves rest, cognitive and mental rest, but again, those recommendations would be coming from a healthcare provider. I want to reinforce that, that I'm keeping that health provider as the central person in determining what the course of action is. And then the return to play, again, I'm telling you this sort of just as a general understanding, which again, I think coaches should have, is that the return to play protocols, particularly on the National Federation of High School site that I just mentioned, talk a lot about the progression of how you gradually ease an, an athlete back into activity, and if there are symptoms that you regress a bit in that return to play protocol. But again, I, I look at that as information for me so that I'm understanding what the healthcare provider is recommending, not something that I'm necessarily overseeing or monitoring myself as a, as a youth sport coach, for example. But have an action plan. Know what your role is relative to your parental role or your um, coaching role and so forth. Well, that was a brief overview and foundation then of some information that will lead to nicely, I think, to what some of the uh, points that Dr. Smith and Dr. Brooks will be making. Secondly, let me tell you a little bit about what the surveillance literature shows us about how common concussions are among female athletes. And in some cases, I have some information relative to male athletes. Uh, first of all, the extent of the problem is for, for interscholastic sports, about 9% of the interscholastic sports injuries are concussion injuries, and about 6% of intercollegiate sports injuries are concussion injuries. Estimates, the most current ones that I've seen, range from about 1.6 to 3.8 million sport-related concussions, is what I'm talking about here, in the United States. Now, let's talk about frequency. If you look at the right-hand side of my slide for a moment, frequency, stay with me, is the number of concussions. I'm going to talk about rate in a minute. But if we look at surely the numbers of concussions and the nature of the health problem, males still have significantly higher numbers of concussions in sports than females. But again, a large percent of that is explained by football in particular. But, and, and males' greater participation in collision types of sports. So males do sustain more sport-related concussions in terms of numbers than females, and I've seen that pretty consistently across levels. So concussions are more common, sport-related concussions are more common among males. Among younger athletes, the younger developing brain seems more susceptible to concussion, and you've also got more young athletes participating, if you think about it. During competitions, as compared to practices, typically the rates are higher during competitions from the high school and collegiate data that I've seen. And in contact and collision sport, sports, concussions are more common, as you might expect. So that's some baseline surveillance information. Now, what's received a lot of attention in media coverage lately really relates to rates of injury. And just to help you briefly understand what we mean by a rate of injury, on the left-hand side of my slide, if you think of one athlete participating in one game or practice, that's considered to be one athlete exposure, typically. And so you're controlling for the unit of time that an athlete participates in practice or competition. Because also, as we know, females, on average, are less physically active than males. So this is a way of controlling for that variable, if you will. So based on this rate indicator in the surveillance literature, what do we see? And my summary slides here are composite of a variety of different sources. But essentially what I see, my read on it, is that the rates of injury are higher for females as compared to males in the similar sports, somewhat similar sports of ice hockey, soccer, basketball, and softball compared to baseball. So female athletes in those sports sustain concussions at a higher rate than males. I've seen somewhere on the average of twice as many in terms of the rate being twice as high. I've seen somewhat mixed results for the sport of lacrosse. I've seen some studies show it one way or the other, and there's a little bit different rules there, I realize, with lacrosse and ice hockey. And in volleyball, which is my favorite sport, I see from the little bit that's out there fairly gender similar rates. But again, for most of the team sports, it is true from what I've seen in the literature that female athletes sustain concussion at a higher rate than males do in those comparable sports. Now, what about comparing sport and level data for female athletes just within female athletes? The highest concussion rates for female athletes are in the sports of ice hockey, soccer, and basketball. 
and concussion rates for female athletes are higher in intercollegiate sport typically than high school sport. So just some basic information for you. Now I found online this very recent study that's just come out early 2011, which was really did a nice job, one of the best articles I've seen in terms of looking at gender comparison and trends over time. And basic take home messages for me from this study were that boys sustained 75% of the concussions in these 12 sports that are listed in my lower right hand side, and girls sustained 25%, so it's that same finding, more frequent concussions in males, and overall these sports, girls had half the concussion rate of boys, again, across these six sports. And the other thing, of course, that you notice in the graph is that there's a trend toward increasing, dramatic increases in the numbers of concussions, probably both a function of better reporting and better screening and reporting, if you will, for concussion, but also perhaps an indicator of sports getting bigger, faster, stronger, more momentum, more forces, and so forth. The other piece that was interesting then to follow up on what I just mentioned a few moments ago is in terms of similar sports, this is the graph for similar sports. You'll notice here on similar sports, overall, across these sports of soccer, basketball, and softball, baseball, the top bar is the girls. And so the girls across the whole time span from 1998 to the 2008, I believe it was, uh, across that whole time span, girls had a higher concussion rate than boys across that whole time span. So again, we see that same finding of four comparable sports that girls have a higher concussion rate. In the lower right-hand side, it's a little hard to see, but it's lacrosse, and you see that sort of mixed pattern that I was talking about. And in this data set, the most recent data in 2008 shows a higher concussion rate for males than females. But again, I've seen different studies that's somewhat mixed. Now, that was high school athletes. That was based on 25 schools over several years' worth of data, so a really solid data set from that set of schools at least. This is based on NCAA data across divisions, across many years of data. I believe it was 16 years worth of data. And I've just pulled out uh, data points from that article and plotted them in a way that I found kind of interesting. So look for me at the top part of the, uh, top, top part of the graph where it says overall. What I've done is collapsed the concussion injury rate overall across the sports that are listed here for all those sports. And you see that, to me, just eyeballing them, the males and females are virtually identical in terms of the overall concussion injury rate. However, if you go to the bottom end of the graph where I've labeled it comparable, I'm again looking at the baseball, softball, basketball, soccer. Across those three sports collapsed across games and practices across divisions, NCAA divisions, you see that, again, just looking at it, it looks to be like the women have a higher concussion rate than um, the men do for those comparable sports. So again, it's reinforcing the points that I've made earlier. Uh, finally, let me speak very briefly about some risk factors that our two following speakers will, will be telling you a bit more detail about some, uh, some of these. But again, I think about, okay, so if we understand what a concussion is, we're, we're good at watching, listening, and learning. We understand their surveillance. What, if anything, can we do in terms of understanding risks with the long-term mindset of reducing risks, of course? So in order to reduce them, we have to understand them. And uh, I'm always drawing things. People make fun of me, but this is one of my many drawings of a way of sort of looking at the multiple major categories of risk factors that affect Injury in general is how I've used it in the past, and today I tried to put some ideas in relative to concussion injury in specific. And so the basic point is that I think there are these major categories of physical, sociocultural, psychological, and biological factors that ri affect risk an athlete's risk of injury through the mechanisms of affecting exposures, choices, and hazards, and so forth, the things that the act athlete actually does or is exposed to. And so let me give you a brief example of each one of these. So in the quadrant that I had labeled physical, an example that comes to mind that relates to, to the ice hockey, the sport of ice hockey that Dr. Smith will be talking about relates to rules of play. There was a nice uh, study by Carolyn Emery from Canada that looked at body checking in ice hockey among peewees, 11 to 12 year old ice hockey players. And they had a sample, there, there were far more males in the sample, but there were some female athletes in the sample. And the take home message was very clear. Players in those checking leagues had a threefold increased risk of concussion and severe concussion, among other injuries. In other words, checking is very hazardous to your mental health in terms of concussion risk.
That evidence seemed very clear, a very solid study. So that's an example of physical risks of play that is under debate in the hockey world, as you'll hear from Dr. Smith, in terms of checking and when it should be allowed and if it should be allowed and so forth. From another of my quadrants is the sociocultural quadrant, and I found this article quite interesting on illegal play. Overall, 6.4% of high school sports-related injuries were related to, to illegal play. That seems quite high to me. That seems like that's something we could do something about, I'd like for us to do something about. And particularly rele relevant to our present conversation is that the greater, a greater proportion of illegal play injuries were to the head face and concussions in specific. So in other words, 25%, over 25% of the illegal play injuries were concussions. That's a lot, in my opinion. And just as an aside, since we're talking about girls and women, of all the sports they looked at in terms of illegal play injuries, the highest percent of illegal play injuries were in girls' sports, girls' basketball, girls' soccer. So 14% of the injury, the, the uh, illegal play injuries in, 14% of the injuries in girls' basketball were illegal play injuries, if that makes sense. So that's, uh, again, something we should be able to do something about. From a psychological standpoint, in my quadrant, I, there were multiple studies that really looked at what I have tentatively labeled comprehension. Do athletes understand the risks? Do the people around them understand the risks? Do athlete, re, athletes report? Do they know what the symptoms are? Do they adhere to return to play guidelines? And the messages are that you know it's somewhat positive for females. Again, the preliminary evidence would tell us that maybe girls are a little bit better at reporting, a little bit more in tune with symptoms. Um, but nonetheless, there's certainly a significant set of both female and male athletes who don't adhere to return to play guidelines, who aren't familiar with the symptoms or fail to report them. So there's enough psychological risk there that it's something that we need to address. And finally, in my final quadrant, I'm going to defer to the two next speakers, but just set them up a bit by saying that in my mind, some of the topics that they'll be touching on are really examples of biological potential biological risk factors. I need to be careful how I say that because I think the verdict is still out a bit in terms of whether being female is in fact a risk factor for concussions above and beyond the other types of risk factors that we've talked about. So Dr. Brooks and Dr. Smith, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about these two topics and I'll be taking notes myself. So in summary, concussions are serious brain injuries that need proper evaluation and care. Secondly, female athletes have fewer concussions but higher rates of concussions in comparable sports compared to male athletes. And third, that there are a complex combination of risk factors that relate to an athlete sustaining a concussion injury. And with that, I'll introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jill Brooks. I am not Dr. Brooks. I'm Nicole Lavoie. I'm just uh, doing a quick tech Switch here. Thank you. Hi there. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, who would have thought when we had our chance meeting in California that this would have been the genesis of this panel and discussion. I thank you both for allowing me to be here. And it was wonderful today meeting with the other two speakers. Just a little about me. I worked uh, in uh, the medical school at, in New Jersey for approximately 13 years in the Department of Neurology. And I have been out in clinical practice for eight years. And so currently, most of my work is of a clinical nature, but I've been invited to speak to you about what the research in the area of concussion and concussion in female athletes means. And I must tell you that there are some things I'm very excited about, but I think I've come away with more questions than I have answers for you. And, uh, but there are some really exciting things on the forefront that I'm going to try to discuss with you and share with you now. So what we know is that concussions really have been described in the literature for centuries. And 
And uh, brain injury is uh, something that's very, very interesting because particularly when we talk about concussions, a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. And by mild, we are referring to the fact that uh, the mild refers to the initial impact as opposed to uh, the long-term uh, effects. And we know that we're very excited about the direction that we're moving in terms of looking at all aspects of this. So we're looking at sex and gender, but what I'm going to speak to you about today are some of the biological issues, the neurologic cascade that we see from a biological standpoint, uh, cultural aspects as well as looking at genetics, and try to really tease out all of these factors along with some of the pre and comorbidities that are associated with it as well. So just to add on what Diane has already spoken about, a concussion is a clinical syndrome, and it's characterized by immediate and hopefully transient changes in what goes on for people neurologically. And we see an alteration in consciousness with a change in different types of skills. This really represents a very complex uh, pathophysiologic process, and it is the result of uh, multiple traumatic biomechanical uh, forces that are exerted on the brain. So what we know is we have this neurobiological cascade that occurs when somebody sustains a concussion. And this is the same sort of neurobiological sequence that occurs in both moderate and severe concussions. And what we see is this injury-induced vulnerability that occurs from anywhere from seven to 10 days out from a concussion. And what happens is the brain is flooded by potassium and calcium ions, and there is a restriction in cerebral blood flow. So at the same time that the brain is requiring more glucose or food for the brain, what happens is as a result of the injury, we see that there is a restriction in cerebral blood flow. So this ratio or this imbalance that occurs between fuel use or the need for more glucose in the brain to exert uh, control over this extra set of ions that are being pumped uh, really is unbalanced because of the level of decreased blood flow to the brain. This also ends up setting the stage, by the way, for more severe injury after in, an individual experiences repeated concussions. And right now, when I spoke with several researchers in this area, including David Havda, whose work I just reported to you, uh, although people may start uh, looking at the idea of is there a difference between the neurobiological cascade in males and females, nothing has really been uh, definitively documented in the research at this time. But some very exciting things have been happening in the areas of uh, neuroimaging. Typically, in the area of concussion, in clinical use, when somebody sustains a concussion, what ends up happening is you will hear that they are referred perhaps for a CAT scan or later on down the line, if they do not recover very quickly after weeks or a month perhaps, an MRI may be uh, indicated. But typically, we diagnose or we rule in a concussion after a CAT scan is within normal limits, primarily because we are looking for something more significant or severe, including a, ba uh, a skull fracture or a bleed in the brain. And the same thing with MRIs. Typically, we are looking later on to see if there is any sort of damage or stretching of axons or changes in the white matter, which tends to deal with more of the efficiency in the brain. 
And what we're seeing now is with new techniques that are being used in the research realm that we are seeing changes in the different kinds of metabolism in the brain that is occurring post-concussion. We are also seeing, even in concussion, changes at the level and damage to the axon, perhaps maybe not death to the axon, as we frequently will see in more severe brain injuries, but damage. And none of this we were able to discern with CAT scans or brain images um, with MRI. Now, in humans, throughout the lifespan, we are seeing these changes in pediatric, adolescent, and adults, and in some studies, they are being correlated with changes in uh, cognition. So changes related to attention and concentration, speed of processing information, and short-term memory. And also, in looking at rodents, where much of the information we have about the neurobiology of concussion comes from rodent and uh, animal studies, we're also seeing changes or difficulties as it relates to spatial memory, difficulties with navigation, and, uh, and so that has been very exciting, as well as looking at um, measures of what kind of changes are happening in white matter tracts, as well as in frontal areas of the brain, in both the inferior and superior uh, frontal areas, that again correlate with changes in motor speed, executive functions such as initiation, organization, planning, as well as uh, behavior ratings of symptoms that correlate with these findings. So in the area of sex and gender, differences, what we know is that there are differences that have been noted early in life, uh, and we know that with women, uh, in particular, uh, even early in the lifespan, there has been a significant amount of data pointing to the fact that women tend to be uh, have an advantage in the area of verbal skills, both in terms of verbal language, in terms of verbal expression, as well as decoding or understanding language, spelling, processing speed, and fine motor skills, as opposed to males who may have more strengths in spatial skills or quantitative skills or gross motor skills and strength. We also know that brain structures and size has been identified as being different in males and females, that uh, pain perception is uh, different, and this may not be related to uh, gender differences or actual perception of pain, but even on an involuntary level, we can see changes in papillary or pupillary responses. Uh, that, uh, that really give us a sense that uh, pain is being identified. We also know that, uh, that there is a suggestion that uh, these, again, are not related to attitude or response bias. Uh, also, we see differences in the uh, frequency of painful diseases, in immune responses, and there has been a description of uh, higher incidence in general of headache with a 5 to 1 ratio, with headache being more uh, frequently seen in females as opposed to males, and a similar pattern has been described in the area of the rate of post-traumatic or post-concussive migraine as well. So uh, just speaking a little bit about concussion incidents, some of the data, again, is kind of interesting in terms of looking at a meta-analysis that was described by Dick. And uh, there seem to be some differences both in absolute injury rates, which you've heard already, but also that the mechanism of concussion may be different in males and females. But again, the questions that keep arising is, is there a greater risk or which represents a true difference or what is in part what we're seeing report bias or reporting bias? And what you'll hear is that this is a major concern that seems to run through all of the literature that we are seeing in the area of sex and gender related to concussion at this point in time, is that uh, what are we seeing here? And does it really represent true sex differences 
or uh, report biases in terms of not just rate and incidence of concussion, but reporting of symptoms. So uh, some studies have really looked at this idea, and, and, and something that's very critical is that much of the research on severity of injury, uh, the early work, was really done by looking at rates of moderate and severe injury. It has not been looked at uh, as much in concussion. And many of the earlier studies really pointed to non-sports-related injury data. And in that way, there were extrapolations that were made and that in some ways are still made between more severe injuries as opposed to more of the uh, injuries that are considered to be milder. So there have been higher incidences of reports of severity, higher incidence of second impact syndrome, which I will get into in a little bit, and also higher incidence of fatalities associated with more severe injuries. And again, many of the researchers question, why are we seeing this? And again, nothing hard and fast has been delineated. And many of the researchers, particularly Faris and Alves, when they did their metacognitive analyses, really commented on the fact that uh, there was really a paucity of research that was done looking at female athletes or females and the uh, injury that they uh, experience. So we know that there are also anatomical difficulties that uh, have been positive. Uh, also, the idea that whether you are a male or a female, stronger neck muscles seem to be better able to absorb and dampen some of the forces that are associated with transmission to the brain with brain injuries. We know that females tend to have higher ball to head ratios and that these, de these different mass effects really can impact both linear acceleration associated with an injury as well as rotational and angular injuries as well. Plus, there's another piece that plays a role here, and that is whether or not you are prepared and you are anticipating the hit. And it seems as though if your neck is tensed, if you are in better position and are prepared for the hit, or prepared for the, the potential injury or th that is being directed towards you, that perhaps less of the force is being directed at the head and taken by more of the body and the next segment as well. So just like we see there are some differences between uh, developmentally uh, women and men what we in terms of their cognitive functioning, we see the same things that are recently being reported in the concussion literature, noticing that both uh, at baseline and as well as post-concussion testing, that females tend to score better as would be predicted on verbal memory, speed of processing skills, and also worse on visual memory and visual spatial abilities. And the same trend was seen uh, when looking at post-concussion scores. We also know that uh, there is a significant decrease in reaction times and self-reported symptoms uh, that we've been seeing in this literature. And also that some people are reporting that there is actually no difference in the number of symptoms that are reported, the resolution time after a concussion, and also any differences in return to play and the time to get someone to return to play, whether they are males or females. What we do is, is, is see, which is very interesting, is that some of the symptoms may be different for males and females. With females, we can see drowsiness and increased sensitivity to noise, and it is interesting to note also that developmentally, we see that uh, females tend to have better hearing acuity, and perhaps these difficulties in sensitivity to noise in some way may be related to this. 
Also in work that I have done, we've seen that uh, there is a higher incidence of reporting of headache as well. And males in this one study by Frummer, they, uh, she happened to notice that males were presenting with higher incidence of reporting of confusion, disorientation, and memory problems post-concussion. So one thing I'd like to say is if we are seeing different functioning both at baseline as well as in terms of post-concussion and what we may be thinking about further along the line is that perhaps we need to focus our treatment as well as our education and our prevention measures and target females and male athletes in a very different way. Now, some of the issues uh, that are really mixed in terms of our knowledge of what the direction is with hormones is uh, how they impact males and females. Much of the work in the area of hormones has been done with, uh, uh, with animal models, and what we know is that there appear to be protective effects. But Overall, there are some concerns about whether or not the protective effects are for males, for females, and there are lots of different uh, data about this. In terms of ischemic stroke, what we know is that females who are uh, premenopausal have more of a protective effect, and once uh, women become menopausal, the neuroprotective effect is gone. We know that there are protective effects at the cellular level for both estrogen as well as for progesterone, but there are some researchers who are pointing to the fact that the protective effect in the role may be better for males and not existing for females. So there are big questions about this. The protective effects of progesterone are something that are, uh, that are very strong as well, but the question then becomes, is this protective effect primarily as it relates to males or females? We know that both progesterone and, ex and estrogen exert some very significant effects at the cellular level. The question then becomes, can we generalize much of the work that's been done with animal models, particularly rodents, to uh, the human models? And that's a big concern. Second impact syndrome is when someone sustains an initial concussion, is recovering from that, and then sustains a second concussion. There is a significant amount of swelling and edema in the brain and a loss of auto or blood flow regulation that occurs. And particularly, we see this most predominantly in adolescent males, and the thought being that perhaps Female hormones are exerting an, a, uh, an effect that is protective in adolescent females. Now, most of the, the work on genetics has been with APOE, and it's this idea that uh, we need to look at genetic models in order to be able to put this all together. And so it's not just about hormones exerting effects, but we know that genetics plays a significant role as well. And there are several or three allelic forms that are seen with APOE. And it seems as though the APOE4 is the, the, the allelic form that is associated with higher incidence and poorer recovery related to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is repeated blows and concussive or subconcussive blows. But also, there is now some controversial data saying that maybe this is a, a problem, but there are some researchers who say that it is not. And we know that the first research on this was looking at boxers. Also, there has been more work looking at retired New York Giants football players as well. And now we're starting to see that there are certain proteins, certain uh, uh, neurofibrillary tangles, and uh, that are seen in the brains of, of individuals, particularly males right now, that have come to post and uh, that these individuals are looking like they have 
uh, Alzheimer's disease. When I contacted uh, a colleague of mine who is doing this work, he indicated to me, although they have women who have uh, indicated that at, when they die, they will donate their brains, currently the only brains that have been analyzed have been in male athletes. Some exciting things that are happening are in the area of biomarkers, uh, looking at protein fragments that cross the blood-brain barrier after a traumatic brain injury. And right now, this seems a little premature to say anything more about this. They're looking at this in moderate and severe brain injury, but there is only an N of 34 subjects, so this is on the road in terms of the future. There are cultural factors in terms of how we look at women in our society uh, that really supports this idea of looking further at gender bias, reporting bias that impacts uh, individuals, and also premorbid conditions such as migraine, history of ADHD or learning difficulties, sleep disorders and mood disturbances, as well as age that affect how an individual responds to a concussion, as well as repeated injuries. So in summary, we know that sex and gender makes a difference, as does anatomical and biomechanical and hormonal issues, genetics, cultural factors, as well as age and pre and comorbid conditions. So thank you. So while we're um, shifting to our final speaker, and because I know that Dr. Smith is going to talk much about hockey, let, let's just have everybody stand up. Seventh inning stretch. Go ahead. And for those of you who know me, you know that I like to do this. You know, if this is true for you, sit down. So this is for Dr. Smith. If you are associated with hockey, a coach, a parent, a sport parent, in hockey or an athlete, you can sit down. Hockey people. A few. Okay. That's not too many. All right. Everybody can sit down, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Smith. Good evening. What was Nicole trying to do, make me feel I have a hostile audience because I'm going to talk about hockey? Um, I'm going to talk about things a little more generally than that, but I'm really pleased to be here and I'm excited to get on toward the panel because so many of you are experts and I know we're going to learn a lot from you. Uh, my focus will be on concussion prevention and on some of the education programs. And I'd like you to meet Callan Ainsley Mayer, who's pictured on the slide here, and she is now six. Um, my thanks to Mary Jo Kane and Nicole Lavoie for creating this panel on concussion in female athletes. It's a timely but a very poorly understood topic topic as you've learned. And there's a picture of Nicole there, don't you love it, that she plays both hockey and I think soccer. I'd also like to thank Dr. Uh, Michael Stewart, who couldn't be here this evening, and Dr. Diane Weiss Bjornstahl for the very positive influences they've had on my career. So thanks to them. And I see Hal Terse is here. There is some hockey friendly folks. Um, my objectives are to consider why females have a higher incidence of concussion than males. And that's a challenge because as you've heard all of these things presented, it's hard to sort of sort through which factors are really making a difference. It's a challenge because there is, as was stated, a paucity of good studies. So my why that I'll be presenting is the sum of some views of our sports medicine uh, providers at Mayo and then my own kinesiology assessment from the literature and experience. I'll also be discussing concussion prevention for female athletes, including education and behavior modification that we mentioned in the intro. Well, why am I going to focus on hockey a little bit tonight? Well, why? Because Minnesota is the state of hockey. Hockey is a fast, aggressive contact sport. It's played on slippery ice surrounded by hard boards. Most concussions evaluated in our sports medicine center are hockey-related. 
and ice hockey has, as you saw, the highest incidence of concussion in females. I believe the discussion will generalize to other sports or be applicable. And also, female participation in hockey is increasing. Do you believe me? Well, look at this slide. In 19, what was it, 03, 04, the females, there were 7,393. And in this last year, they were up by 38.7% for a total of 12,250. 12, uh, 12, uh, we're still just around 25% of the uh, total population, and the males far outnumber, but female participation is really growing. Well, has women's ice hockey changed in 88 years? In 88 years ago, my mom and some of her friends were playing. This one is actually from Cloquet, but my mom played up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Notice their skinny little necks, and they didn't wear helmets. <laughs> and they had only some skates, only the goalie had pads. And then look at my little Callan. In her first year, she was already in a helmet with her little breezers and pads and whatever. And now if you saw her, she looks like a little Katie. And I'll introduce Katie properly here in a moment. But overall, I think you can see when you look at what's changed across 88 years, we've got some size, speed, skill, darn it, but we know there's aggressiveness and a big change in the equipment. So the survey that we gave ended up with uh, 10 respondents who are healthcare providers, and they determined that the age, roughly, of the uh, athletes they were seeing were between 10 and 30 years of age. Two orthopedic surgeons working with us said they were mostly coming from hockey and soccer, and why, they said, was because of the less neck strength and that the females were reporting more signs and symptoms. I realize that's equivocal, but these are their opinions. Three physical medicine PM&R docs also said they were uh, injured, were coming from, concussed, were coming from hockey, soccer, and basketball. Again, they felt it was less neck strength, reporting more symptoms, and clearly less neck muscle mass. Then four, uh, three physical therapists reporting thought it was from, uh, they were seeing their uh, concussed females from um, soccer, hockey, and lacrosse. They were worried that the lacrosse females, I think, aren't still wearing uh, helmets, correct? and uh, that there was a lack of physical strength, and that perhaps hitting the ball in soccer was a problem. We know the research doesn't show that yet, but these are providers and their opinions. Um, then there's one particular physical therapist who you wonder why he gets added stature here, but he's an athletic trainer, a strength and conditioning coach. He's a father and he of a hockey player coaching and plays himself. And he said his patients were coming from soccer and snowboarding, and he attributed that to the decreased ice awareness secondary to non-checking. He didn't think the females were vigilant because they weren't sort of fearing a check, and so they weren't ready for it. He also felt there was a decreased core and upper body strength. Now notice that nine out of ten of those providers ranked that lack of neck strength most highly. Well, now I'd like to introduce you to Katie, and do I see you, Katie? Great. Do you want to just stand up for one second? Because you mean a lot to me. Um, OK. Um, K Katie was an exceptional high school mentorship student with me uh, when she was at Century and uh, we're down at Mayo and gave me permission to use these pictures. And I felt that if I could just approach this through the numbers one through five, and remember as we're speaking that the formula kinetic energy equals a half mass times velocity squared is influenced, think about what that means, it's influenced by speed, size, strength, and equipment, and we'll be speaking about that. Well, looking at the helmets, what do we know about helmets? Well, all they really do is protect from skull fractures and focal trauma, and that's true of both from males and females. They do not protect from concussion. The brain, as it bounces forward against the skull in a linear fashion or a rotational fashion when it's spinning, uh, it are not protected from the helmet, no matter how hard they're trying. But brilliant, brilliant engineers and biomechanics people are working on it, and we may get to the point that, as with NASCAR, there are some improvements happening. But for the meantime, we can't rely on the helmet except for what I mentioned. 
Now there's some data coming in on little female peewee teams from Michelle Keatley at University of Toronto, uh, 11 and 12 year old girls, and some data coming in is showing that about 560 hits using the helmet uh, instrument uh, telemetry system that are over 10G in about 58 games. And 10G is sort of anything a, a 10 and above is what they count. Anything below that they don't but many G-forces in football and in, in men's hockey and so on are up at around, you know, over 200 G-force. Um, some data also coming in on women's hockey teams from Dartmouth, and I was speaking to Rick Greenwald yesterday. Uh, I think you'll be seeing some maybe in Med Science Sport coming out soon or some of those journals, so you might want to watch it. They have both college and high school women wearing helmets, and at this point they're finding that the males are sustaining twice as many impacts as females and that the impact severity is much greater in the males, which makes sense. Many more 169, 179G with the uh, collisions and the checking. What's interesting is that the impact location on the helmet where the hits are occurring, 60% uh, of those are to the back of the head in females, 50% in males. Then there's a little data in soccer uh, with the females in soccer in Australia wearing those helmet protectors that they think uh, would protect from trauma from heading, and they found a higher acceleration in the females, and I think that's attributed to the increased mass that the helmet plus the, the head on a slim neck is leading to more rotational spinning. Well, what about the female head, the brain? Well, we all know that we are very different, but um, in what ways? Well, overall, females tend to report more headaches and some dizziness, fatigue. We know there are more migraine diagnoses, uh, not cluster uh, migraines, but it, more migraine diagnoses in females, and they have been uh, said to have a more protracted or longer recovery. The metabolic cascade that was discussed by Jill is uh, thought to be altered by hormones in females, still not hard data, but there, uh, with that cascade, we know that when that calcium is plugging up on a AMP, is trying to become ATP and have a phosphorylation on it, and instead that calcium is plugging up that channel, which is contributing to the fatigue. And so uh, we know there's an explanation for that, but whether it's influenced by hormones, we're not sure. Now, the NIH functional MRI study that's been on, going on for a long time now is tending to show a little less density in the corpus callosum, and they're saying that that's secondary to less myelin on the axons than on males. And I don't know if this makes sense, but when you think that concussions result from linear and rotational acceleration and that spinning effect and so on, when you think about stripping the green off, the myelin off the axon, and you leave that little thin red axon here, can you imagine it spinning and tangling more readily? You know, perhaps there really is something anatomically going on with the uh, less myelin. But those are just questions. We don't have answers on it, but they do give you pause. Well, what about the female mind? People have been trying to figure that out for centuries, haven't they? Um, but with, when you think about competitive psychology, um, we know the females are becoming more aggressive. Diane alluded to some of the studies. We know they're enjoying dominance in their physicality and causing fear in their opponents, you know, kind of liking to intimidate a little bit, aren't we? And um, that also the females definitely admit to cheating and infractions when officials aren't watching, so we're not too different from the boys. Um, now, what about this neck anticipation? We're hearing a lot about it, and Tierney has done two very nice studies, and on one of them, he did note that the females did activate those neck muscles earlier than the males, but they had less mu neck muscle mass and less strength in males. Thus, there was greater head acceleration upon force application, which would predispose them to that axonal stretching. I want all of you to just take a minute, tighten those muscles right now, right across your neck. You know, tighten really, really hard. Now picture I came at you and just clunked you from the side. <laughs> okay. Your head wouldn't move very much, would it? It's not going to spin very much when you're guarded up and those coacting muscles are fired. Now relax for a minute, okay? Now picture that all of a sudden you get clunked from the side or clunked from the head forward. Do you see what I mean? You, now you're vulnerable. So there is a lot, I think, that we need to think about about that anticipation, and there's a lot as coaches that can be done and uh, folks in biomechanics and so on. The core strength, I'm only going to, oh, 
with on, uh, uh, Jill mentioned about Mihalik's work and he's got research on females now too and that should be available to us very soon in terms of the anticipation and how that is influenced by the g-force being measured from the instrumented helmets. I think you all know that when I talk about instrumented helmets it's the six triaxial accelerometers that are positioned in the similar locations front sides, back, and top of the helmets, and the software dumps the g-forces, jumps the force into the bins that allow you to see where the hits are coming from and how it's being measured. Okay, core strength, we know that that stability on the ice is so important to prevent collisions from crashing into the boards and so forth. Now, when we think about preventing concussions, uh, we want to think about um, mandatory education and it has to be done across individuals, teams, affiliates, so that would be like Minnesota Hockey is an affiliate of USA Hockey, right? Hockey British Columbia would be an affiliate of Hockey Canada. Uh, but it has to be done right across those four sectors. We need to educate early. And when we think about educating females, those of you who are educators know better than I about taking into account gender preferences, developmental issues. And you need to be able to focus on cognition here in the frontal uh, uh, lobes, in the uh, think about cognition, and that would include social. Uh, factors here, and then you want emotional uh, control here, what Diane calls playing with positive intensity, not just playing to aggress, and that there will be an influence of the cognition and the emotion on the motor cortex, which is where our movement patterns are coming from. So we need to be thinking about educating in that manner. Now, when we educate kinesthetically, it's really going to be important that the girls practice a lot of the heads-up hockey. And little Callan this, this year was being asked to slide into the boards and then uh, on her tummy kind of thing, you know, full speed, and then with the little head up so that they can really train the kids to do that. And I think demanding that the kids are have the head on the swivel to avoid the collisions. And sometimes you'll see teams where they've got two, maybe two full teams of kids on one half of the ice, all skating with the puck and with the boys. And I'm sure the girls do it too, and they need to in order to train them to be so alert. Now we're going to just speak about the educational programs, HEP, Play It Cool, and Think First, which are the content for what you want to put into that uh, prefrontal cortex. Now, just uh, for a second here, I wanted to just remind us that we had the Ice Hockey Summit at Mayo in October, and Diane and Nicole played major roles, as did Helters, and we focused on six sectors, saying that uh, to decrease concussions, we really need to have better databases and, and measure metrics. We needed to focus on equipment and arenas. We needed to recognize, diagnose, manage, and return to play. We needed the education and, and prevention, and that's what I'm talking about right here. And and we would need rules, policies, and proper enforcement, and then be able to communicate properly. And so uh, ranked by the 270 or 80 attendees under the education and prevention sector were a need to mandate this concussion education right across coaches, officials, players, and parents to charge hockey organizations with delivering the existing educational content, some of the materials we already have, but educate for behavioral and cultural change, just as we're speaking about. And so the HIP program, many of you know about it, and I'll speak about it in a moment, but it has three components, all of which are evidence-based. Fair Play has three or four studies to back it up. Coaching Excellence, we use Smith & Small's work and to decrease attrition and so on and skill development. And skill development, I wanted to mention, we were emphasizing four, three to four practices to every game. Remember what Diane mentioned about the games in hockey, you have anywhere between 10 and 25 times more injuries in games than you do in practices. So if you use the developmental years to focus on your practices when the kids have the puck on the stick, up to 39 minutes instead of about a minute in hockey in uh, games, uh, you're really going to grow the game better in terms of scale. And then, of course, the CDC materials get put into place in all programs. Think First out of Canada with their Smart Hockey video. We'll talk about that. And Play It Cool, a coaching uh, program. It's interactive that which should be released in a year. Now, these programs are evidence-based. They're all hockey-specific, but they can be adapted to other sports. All have outcome data, and two are gender-neutral. Now, 
Hep, just for a moment here, uh, remember it started when one uh, father killed a coach in front of a youth hockey team, and uh, uh, many people at Minnesota Hockey came together, the director of the officiating, coaching, and so on, to form this program. And as I mentioned, it's evidence-based, and it goes from, th there's three portions to it, and you educate across coaches, officials, parents, and players simultaneously so they all get the same message. Most of you, I think, know how this works, but if this were a bantam league uh, and the kids were starting out, it's 16 penalty minutes, I think, how the bantams get to start out with. And if you notice here, uh, this team had 19 wins. It would have 38 points, and it got uh, two ties. That would give them 40 points, and they earned 17 of their uh, fair play points across that season for a total of 57. Now, look at this other team. They lost a few more games, but they earned more uh, fair play points. So they've also got 57 points, and these teams are tied going into the standings. Okay, so they're, they're going to play off against each other, and you've got skilled sportsmanlike teams to role model for the younger kids. So it's really a, a great program. One checking from behind or, or head hit penalty at a 10 and 2 would almost for sure cause a team to forfeit the fair play point. So you're, you're uh, really trying to reduce the uh, unfair, uh, dangerous uh, play. Now, does it take a little bit of work to analyze the kind of data that comes in? <laughs> The research coordinators are gems, aren't they? And we'll be getting our seventh year or sixth year in about a week's time from this season. What are we finding? You'll be glad to see there's data on the boys and the girls. The youngest girls on your left here, you see they start out earning a lot of their fair play points. The points start to decrease a little bit as the kids are getting older. But it, with junior gold, they've just done great. And that's high school age kids. And look at the, the improvement in the fair play points there earning and now they don't want to be without this program and look at the little girls starting out great but again a little bit as they're getting a little bit older there's a little bit of a drop but not bad they're really um, basically doing well but we've got to look at the girls in a little more detail based on this next slide uh, this is checking from behind, and this is just on boys here, squirts. Look at the peewees dropping over the years since the fair play, uh, fair play has been in place. Bantams dropping significantly, and in junior gold coming down nicely too. But we still need to do a lot more of it because these are ones that can really lead to concussion, and as with the head hits. Now, the Think First, uh, we mentioned their smart hockey video, Diane, and I think Nicole both had a chance to look at this. It's just been launched in Canada by Charles Tatter. It's endorsed by all of these uh, hockey organizations. It's gender neutral, lots of emphasis on both the uh, female players and with female coaches. It's free, easily downloadable, and we're hoping it'll be a part of the preseason education for hockey players, and it can be obtained on this website. All right, here's my thoughts for research studies, folks. So uh, it's just a conglomeration of things, and we can talk through them to, uh, later and also tomorrow morning, hopefully. But I think we need to go back and look at some of Michael Smith's data. He did studies uh, in sports sociology. Leo, you'll love that. Uh, and it was seeing which, who was reinforcing the aggression in the males. Was it uh, uh, coaches, their parents, their teammates, the kids themselves? And I think we could learn about that in females very easily and find out uh, why are they aggressing and where are the rewards coming from and what can we do to deter it. I think some of the work that Nicole and, and Diane have done in background anger could be done very nicely in environments in hockey uh, in females at high school and college level. Um, resiliency. I need, think we need to learn which females don't sustain concussion. We're just starting to look at that in junior A. Um, but uh, what is there about uh, certain girls that are they contributing, are they with the puck, but yet they're not getting concussed? I also think we need to use the instrumented helmets and the video to further identify the mechanisms of concussions for the girls and try to see how much is related to the poor anticipation or other, other things we can learn. We need to continue monitoring those functional MRI studies, biomarkers, genetic predictors, and so on that uh, uh, Joe was mentioning.
And I personally think, and I haven't had a chance to take Jill on with this, but I'd like to see us tease depression. I know there's depression in there when any athlete is injured and concussion has just got to be even worse. Think of Crosby, he's been out since what, January 5th. And I think it is influencing some of the reaction time and other measures, but I'd like to see more about that. Now, I mentioned this because Joan Stevenson, I found out, who's been publishing this study out of Queen's University as a graduate of the University of Minnesota and was one of Dr. Stoner's biomechanics students. And she's been looking at the next strength uh, and they can study it under conditions of flexion, extension, lateral movement, and protraction when you're pulling your neck back. And I think pre-season we need to be doing better measures of this and I'd like to see us relate it to what happens in concussion and ours, is there a weakening? You know, I work in sports medicine and I see a lot of our ACL reconstructions. Can you still hear me? Reconstructions, he's waving me back, yeah, you're on your tape. And they lose about an inch and a half of quad, sometimes two inches of quad, just wastes off of the uh, hamstring and the quadricep muscle in just, what, six weeks. And I'm wondering when you're out of your sport and you're out of the weight room and you're having to rest, whether there's sort of a wasting of the neck muscles and if those need to be strengthened along with some of the other neuropsych testing and the graded exercise uh, return to play um, measurements. So my last statement here is um, I would like to contribute something to and in this junior A study that we're going to be starting in the fall we'll be using the uh, instrumented helmets and in the past I've done a lot of research that Diane's had to bear with me on uh, where we've looked at integrating physiologic response such as heart rate or in my yips affected golfers EMG activity and so on but integrating these signals with the videotape. And I think if we could get the big head hits and have them being picked up here, doctors and athletic trainers at the sidelines when they have a player go down and they go to rush out on the ice and the pay, p p there's a pool of blood or something, they would also know what the magnitude was of that hit. And it would be almost like another vital sign as they go out to evaluate. So I think we can uh, do something to contribute a little bit to the faster detection uh, if we're vigilant and, and think how to do this. Okay, so I'd like to conclude with that and say that hopefully at the next concussion in females meeting, we'll have more data and, have, and that both genders will hopefully be at a little less risk than they are now. Thankfully, these kids have not been concussed yet, so I hope we can keep it that way. Thank you very much. Okay, wow, that was a lot of information to pack into our brains in an hour, wasn't it? Let's give our panelists another hand and have the other two come on up. Again, I'm Dr. Nicole Lavoy. I'm the Associate Director of the Tucker Center, and thank you all for coming tonight as our panelists situate themselves for our question and answer session. I think I have about 100 questions, but I'm going to hold mine since um, I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions. We have some mics in the audience. So if you have a question, just please hold up your hand and we'll send them down. So if you guys can come on down. Um, we have one on the aisle right here. Let's start with you. And make sure you speak into the mic because we're recording it. Thank you. I coach a nine and 10 year old little girls hockey team and had my first peanut get a concussion this year. How do you build neck strength in little girls? Yeah. Um, well, since I kind of brought up that can of worms, um, <laughs> I'll try and take a stab at it. Um, let me just say that a very recent two studies have shown that the muscles in the neck that they're looking at the most are the sternocleidomastoid, the traps, and then um, there's two others. Um, and they're still talking about, uh, down in our sports medicine center, about exactly how to do it. And I know you can do some isometrically, just yourself, if the girls were kind of tensing the muscles and you were holding and then releasing. You definitely build some up. Um, and especially if they're focused. I'm going to ask you all to do something with me for a minute now. And he's not my boss anymore, is he, if I stand up? Or is he? 
<laughs> um, can, you, can you just take your arms like this? And I want you to pretend you've got, um, everybody hear me okay? Okay, pretend you've got a 10 pound weight uh, in each hand, and I just want you to follow me, and we're going to pretend we're on a beach in Hawaii while we do three arm curls, and then we're going to do three properly, okay? Take your arms, okay, flex, and extend, and do two more with me. Now, we're lying on a beach in Hawaii. We feel the warm sun, and this is just so useless when we're doing it like that, right? Okay? Okay. Now, let's do it, and I want you to take your mind and put it right on the biceps. Nothing but the biceps now, okay? Everybody? Now take your hands and you've got these 10 pound weights, right? Now flex, okay, feel the resistance, okay? Right through extension, do two more. Okay, good, good. Now what are you finding? That you could be strengthening these muscles and you don't have any weight at all in your hands, but you're focusing completely so that's about all I should say for now, except that they also are trying to strengthen against resistance, where they're putting a weight, a force, and then you're trying to move back against it. But we don't have anything too definite yet. OK? Thank you. Thanks, Ainsley. All right, who else has a question? But you know, uh, also oh, the point that you bring on. up about attention and focus mm -hmm. really sp speaks to us really having good information about the kids that we work with. And if there is any pre-existing attention and focus problems, yeah. because not only is this a predictor of injury, but we do know that individuals that do have pre-existing yeah. Yeah, ADHD mm -hmm. or learning issues, that they appear more significantly impaired after the concussion and they recover more slowly. I think there's another question on the aisle here, Maya. I have two questions. One is in regards to hockey. I actually, um, I'm an athletic trainer and I manage a concussion clinic in Wisconsin. Good. And I have a question regarding peewee hockey. They're talking about in Wisconsin um, getting rid of checking at the peewee level mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of injuries. Mm -hmm. I'm married to a hockey coach. He's mm -hmm. very much Against opposed it. to this. Uh -huh. But part of me says I understand that because he's talking about how you need to train to get to the bantam level. Otherwise, you throw them in the bantam level at age mm -hmm. 13, mm -hmm. and they're all gung-ho. And I have a 14-year-old son who's a bantam, mm -hmm. and he's so excited about hitting I know. that That's they just so. can't wait. I know. So and his dad too. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and so I'm curious what your what your opinion is of that. And then the second one, just real quickly, CT scans at the hospital. We get this all the time. Um, you know, when I get calls to the clinic, is well, they didn't even do a CT or an MRI. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're being instructed, and and I took some impact training, the impact neuropsych testing. Mm -hmm. We're being told that. First of all, it's very expensive, mm -hmm. not necessary, which I totally mm -hmm. get, mm -hmm. that actually an overnight stay in the hospital is more telling mm -hmm. because then you can be watched. And I'm yeah. just wondering what your opinion is yeah. of that versus having a CT because you don't want children exposed to the extra radiation mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious what your yeah. opinion is. Um, why don't I take a stab at the first one on the checking and then um, Jill might want to add in on the imaging but uh, we also uh, had the imaging discussed at the summit, too, and there were some opinions. But on the checking, um, uh, we haven't done a really good job of communicating Dr. Carolyn Emery out of Calgary's big study that was published in JAMA. And uh, Carol, Carolyn Emery studied body checking in peewees, and she studied large numbers of kids in Calgary, like in Alberta, of the Pee Wee Leagues in Alberta, and she used a matched cohort in Quebec. And what you would really like as an athletic trainer is she had independent physical therapy type athletic therapists, um, which is what they call the athletic trainers up in Canada, right? Uh, she had them doing the observing of the concussions and the injuries and so on. And her study was just really outstanding and ended up being about the seventh, sixth or seventh one, I think, that was definitely showing, what is it, four to five times how more concussions uh, with the checking in the peewee 
age groups. And as you know, in Pee Wee, kids are everywhere from being little tiny things that are, what, 65 pounds, and the next one is shaving, you know. Um, so uh, it really is, uh, and, but it's a very charged issue, and uh, a lot of thought has been put into it, but if we can save those kids, and I'd like to have Hal Ter's comment for a second, too. If we can save those kids, and I think, Hal, you, I don't want to use yours, your words, but you'd love to see kids, as the director of coaching for Minnesota Hockey, have more time with the puck, not being afraid of being crunched into the board. But, Hal, do you, would you like to comment on it? She left with the mic. We have the mic back We've down here. We've got lots here. of mics here. Um, and that the Jill mic. could, well, he's getting that mic, yeah. Uh, and just to clarify that the study in Canada, one province has not had checking for quite a number of years, mm -hmm. and the other cohort has body checking in peewees, and they, it was a 35 or 40 percent decrease in injuries, yeah. concussions, including in the non-check. More importantly, I think you cite a, a study where um, they followed those kids up into bantams, and there was no increase in injury from the non-checking yeah. peewee group moving up compared to the other group in Canada that moved up. So yeah. uh, for your husband that's worried, um, <laughs> tell him not to worry, it all works out. Um, you know, we, we're doing a lot of research here on the injuries, which, uh, but maybe not on the causal effect of them. And in ice hockey particularly, um, it's, it's about skills it's about attitudes, cultural attitudes, and if you saw the ESPN OTL uh, uh, show last weekend and saw the coach down in, in Pennsylvania telling his kids to go and wreck the kid on the other team, uh, and they think this, and he, and he was proud of that on national television. I mean, those are the kinds of attitudinal things that, that we also have to address in this whole process. So uh, the proposal in Wisconsin is actually a proposal by USA Hockey and to be a, a rule that will be voted on in June at USA Hockey Congress. Um, and Minnesota is discussing it uh, vigorously um, as, as, as soon as 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, so. And you're going to be away in Jamaica here when they're voting, right? <laughs> Well, Get no, away from I, all no, the, the flack. No, not, not on the vote. I won't be. Okay. Uh, no. okay. Jill, did you yeah. want to address the second part of that? Uh, yeah. I, I think that I can only speak that uh, about uh, in New Jersey, many of the hospitals, as I think all around, are starting to make decisions about allocation of resources and also how to handle the imaging issue in children uh, because there is a dosing of radiation that occurs with that. And I think in many of the hospitals uh, that I have contact with, they have made the decision that if there is no loss of consciousness, that it is better to observe and make a decision based on, uh, and, and also base that information on the severity of the concussion and the information that comes in when the individual arrives in the emergency room or the emergency department. And I'll just add, at the summit, uh, Jeff Bazarian from uh, New York, Rochester, New York, uh, was there, and he's an emergency room physician, and he said their protocol had always required the CAT scan, and nobody was following it because they didn't feel that they were getting any results from it, and that the new, what is it, the fusion, you probably, tensor, yeah, um, yeah is the, the way of the future, and I think it still will have some improving to do, but yeah, thanks. Okay, since we have a whole host of people tuning in live on our live stream, hello to those people. We have a question from the Twittersphere. Julia? <laughs> All right, this is more of a comment that perhaps you, um, you guys would be able to speak to. It says, my concern is that if we gender sport injury, do we further other female sport and give fodder to those who say female athletes are lesser than their male counterparts? Yeah. Well, I, just a piece of that. I'm, I'm certainly not a so sports sociologist, as my colleagues will remind me of often. But here, my take on that is I think that's one reason I was very careful to say uh, that 
when you look at rates versus frequencies, there's a difference there. And I think the piece that I would add to that is I'm very careful about that intentionally because the argument is still, the point is still from a public health standpoint, if you will, or a health problem standpoint, that far more males than females sustain concussions. So why isn't there this same sort of outcry? There is to a certain extent with football, but it's not portrayed in the same way. We had in the Tuck, through the Tucker Center a discussion a year or two ago about a book called Warrior Girls, which um, we read and, and discussed and, and approached from different points of view. And the message I agree with is that the injuries are of a concern, not just concussion injuries, but injuries are a concern for both male and female athletes. And by looking at some similarities as well as differences, certainly does not and should not be portrayed by the media or in popular press as a situation in which, see, here's why girls shouldn't play, because they get hurt more. And I don't see the concussion evidence that way at all. Mm -hmm. I personally can constantly remind myself and those that I speak with that, again, uh, I'm very concerned about males and females. I'm concerned as a parent who has both a son and a daughter. I'm concerned um, just as a general person interested in sport injury. So I don't worry about that. My, I'm, more, I'm less worried about that than I am about doing what we can to protect athletes within, uh, to a reasonable degree or to a reasonable extent and still allow the fun and enjoyment and, of participating in sports. And I see that very similarly for boys and girls. Perhaps others would like to speak to that, or, or Nicole as a, a gender scholar, perhaps. Well, and I think um, there's definitely a danger of othering women when we're only talking about um, differences. And I think our goal with this talk tonight was to bring to the issue, to add to the dialogue around concussions, that yes, female athletes do get concussed. It is a serious issue. And what do we know and what do we not know? What similarities and differences are there so we can all be more educated about an issue that we direly need? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe one more question and then we'll wrap it up. If we don't, one down here on the aisle. So if you sit on the aisle, I guess you are more statistically likely to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just curious to hear if, they, um, if they've done any research or what your research has found, if any, on like the long-term effects of female sustaining multiple concussions and how maybe the chances of getting a concussion and the severity like increases with multiple ones. And then also you've talked a lot about team sports mostly, but I'm wondering if there's any research specific to females or just in general on like individual sports such as like downhill ski racing mm -hmm. or snowboarding where you're maybe not getting hit mm -hmm. by another person, but you mm -hmm. are falling because of speed and gravity and how you can uh, prevent those injuries. Um, I'll just take a crack at the... Um I, I had the opportunity to patrol at Welch for 32 or 33 years, so I did see quite a few of the crashes with the snowboards and the um, uh, skiing racers, ski racers. A lot of times, we were just talking about that today, the courses get set awfully close to the trees, don't they? And in order that the public can kind of be skiing on the wider part of the runs. And But I think the emphasis in ski racing has not been looking at anything gender difference, to my knowledge at the moment, but Team Wendy, uh, is a group who um, the 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 owner of Team Wendy. Uh, let me go back one sec. They sell all the a lot of the liners uh, for the military. There's a sort of a a special liner that they think is very protective, and a lot of the uh, U.S. military have been buying from them. But they lost a daughter in a catastrophic uh, ski injury. She wasn't wearing a helmet, but they made a commitment to, you know, trying to develop better helmets and, and educate so people were. And I think to my knowledge with ski racing and snowboarding, the emphasis has been on that helmet protection and trying to get them wearing them obviously and, and having the better liners. I would still think they're not going to be successful yet for the reasons we talked about. You know, the helmet would, if you hit a tree, it would protect from a depressed skull fracture, but not much else. So, but there was, um, is anybody else aware of any other research in the individual sports? We need it. I was just going to look it up. I actually have a study, 2011, a really nice paper that I was actually just yes. showed Ainsley um, that has this. So I'll look it up quick because I think the other part of your question, Dr. Brooks, could best answer. Yeah. I think that uh, what we know also is that uh, 
that not just looking at either male or females, but uh, this whole idea that once you've sustained one concussion, uh, some very early research that's been replicated has shown that once you've sustained one concussion, you're at four to six times greater risk mm -hmm. of sustaining another concussion. And what we know also is looking at these brains of retired uh, professional athletes is that repeated concussions really do cause considerable damage long term. And so very much what we uh, really need to be doing is thinking about how are we going to guide our prevention and education programs for all of our athletes to really try and protect them from concussions, not just in the here and now and make decisions about uh, return to play and making smart decisions, but what does this mean through the lifespan, not just for the span when you're playing your sport, but what happens later in life when you may be experiencing the sum effect or the net effect of multiple repeated sub-concussive or concussive blows. Mm -hmm. So it's an excellent question. But it's something I think that it, we're starting to become really concerned about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Brooks. Diane, you have yeah, the data well, at I hand? I looked up s skiing and snowboarding quick since you asked about this, and I, I don't, mm -hmm. uh, hadn't recalled it specifically. But the basic uh, messages are that concussions represent 9.6% of, of all injuries in skiers, just to give you a few, few fun facts to know and tell. 14.7% of all injuries in snowboarders 5.7% in snowbladers. And then the gender piece, um, here's a couple sort of pieces to the gender equation in answer to your question. There's evidence that more male than female skiers tend to be injured as a result of collisions with trees. It's sort of the mechanism piece. <laughs> Whereas more females than male skiers tend to be injured as a result of collisions with other skiers. And male skiers are more likely to sustain a head injury than female skiers. So there's a few facts. So yes, and the NCAA data that I spoke briefly about, I reported all of the, the sports that they had indicated in their uh, study. So that's why I wasn't selectively pulling out team sports. But my recollection, and perhaps Moira, I don't know, Novak or others that are very familiar with NCAA, I believe there's concussions have happened in every sport. Mm -hmm. Is that... Fair mm -hmm. to say. Does anyone know, or any of you try to see some athletic trainers there? Yeah. Hey. No. Yeah. If you didn't hear that, uh, they've yeah. had concussion at a golfer who fell off the golf cart. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good place to end. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Um, a couple things. Thank you all for coming. Please take the CDC materials in the lobby. Join us for a snack. And let's give our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you. Now you too.